actually my dexterity is really not failing today, so I'm not sure. So when I say welcome, I actually really mean it, and I, I really am appreciative of you being here. And I want you to know that whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you're into, wherever you've been, wherever you're going, whatever, you are welcome here, and you are cared for in this space, and you're valued. And I want you to know that you being here is important to me. And I really feel, uh, just from the energy in this room tonight, that we're here to support each other as well. So that's going to be very important, as Cara mentioned, over the weekend, because we all need to get along. So I am into the idea of the Buddhist survival camp uh, because I'm interested in how we can actually apply Buddhist teachings in real life. So when I talk to a lot of people, they're pretty stressed out, they're pretty busy, there's things in their life going on all the time, and it seems like what we're doing really is just surviving, <laughs> just surviving life. And if we're not surviving, then we're recovering from surviving life. <laughs> and so it's important to me uh, that we have a practical focus for our spiritual life. And so that's why I'm interested in this, um, this idea of like a Buddhist survival um, camp. So it came from the idea behind, uh, you know, those kind of like school summer camps mm -hmm. where you have to learn forest skills and how to survive. And so for me, it's like, okay, how can we survive this modern world? You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. So that's one thing that I'm interested in, in my spiritual practice, is how can I help people with practical things in their life from the Buddha's teachings. And the second thing that I'm really interested in is encouraging positive, wholesome states of joy, happiness in your hearts. And so those first few things about how to live life well, they're going to help you create these wholesome, joyful, positive mind states. And so that's why um, that's why I wanted to have a little bit of fun, you know. There's a lot of rules here at Buddhist <laughs> Insight, but there is still the opportunity to have some fun. So I'd just like to drop that idea into <laughs> the retreat. Because sometimes we get really serious about our meditation practice. And it's the complete wrong thing to do. Yes, it's important. Your meditation practice is important, but if you're not enjoying it, then what's the point? Seriously, we're supposed to uh, create states of positivity in our hearts. We're not supposed to treat our meditation like a job, like a chore, like something we have to do. We are using meditation as a vehicle for joy and wisdom. We're using meditation as a vehicle to come out of our suffering. So if you're creating more suffering through your meditation, then you're doing something wrong. So this weekend is really about giving you a set of five skills that will help you on the retreat, but also in your life. So those five skills are pretty easy to remember because they all start with the letter R. So they're in order retreat, relax, retrain, reconnect, and recharge. So I'll explain each of these as we go along uh, through the weekend. So there's five skill sessions, and I really hope that you can attend them. They're not compulsory. Nothing that you do here is compulsory. So if you're not into something, if you feel like some time out, then just go to a quiet place and chill out. Try not to uh, uh, annoy other people. So. Um, undoing car some of the things that you, you said but nothing is compulsory except for lunch okay so you must eat and you must also hydrate because as you know we are just like house plants with complicated emotions we just need a little bit of water and some food and we'll be okay so please uh, be yourself on this retreat 
but be mindful of other people. So I want you to have a good time and I want you to really benefit and not just benefit in, in terms of uh, suffering through a weekend without Netflix <laughs> or suffering because you don't have your pillow or the things that are usually around you. I want you to have freedom from that suffering. And so that's why the first survival skill that we're going to explore is this concept of retreat. So you're on a retreat, well done. <laughs> you're already so far ahead of most other people. And I mean that sincerely because you are the creme de la creme of New York society. <laughs> you are refined beings. How many other people have thought about uh, developing their mind throughout history. So even just wanting to come here has been a wholesome action in, in your hearts. It's been a wholesome state for you to develop. Even if that's all you do, you just arrive, that's enough. You've already made it. Even wanting to do some meditation over the weekend is a wholesome state of mind. If you actually do some, even better you're going to get results uh, just from this good intention in your heart. So trust in that and know that you've already done something good for yourself by coming along to this retreat. So things will only get better if you keep on applying yourself in the same way. So when I think about retreat, I think about some synonyms. I think about things like chilling out, detoxing, running away, Hiding, um, me time, what else? Digital detoxing. Anything else? No? One thing, which is the kind of secret behind this, this concept of retreat, is another R word, which is renunciation. Do you know what renunciation means? It means voluntarily giving up something. So this is a special word in Buddhism because it's actually secretly a part of the Buddha's teachings. So it's part of right intention, which some of you might know is the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, also referred to sometimes as right thought. So it's called Nekkama Sankapo. This is renunciation and it's a survival skill. It's voluntarily giving up the things that you think that you need. And that's why it's a very profound practice. The thing that we're giving up is uh, sensory pleasures, which sounds a little bit maybe biblical. I don't know. It sounds a little bit moralistic, sensual pleasures. Like when, I, when someone says sensual pleasures, the first thing I think about is sex. But it's not just about sex. It's not just about things like Netflix or indulging or these kinds of things it's actually kind of just the very stuff of our life but anyway I'll get back to that in a second uh, I just want to touch on um, something that Kara said about um, not using devices and I, I do support her in encouraging you to um, refrain from using your device I know that it's hard. I remember when I first became a monk, um, I still had my phone, but I had no reception. I had the desire for reception and the desire to use my phone. And I had the same news feed for about like two months. But like a monkey, I would open up my phone and I'd <laughs> scroll, hoping that this time, maybe this time, but anyway, so uh, this, here's this woman. She's high on cancelled plans. She's dropped the phone, and there's a little bit of drool coming from her mouth. And this is the kind of ecstasy I want you to embrace. This is <laughs> not suffering. This is freedom. This is the way to go on this retreat. Just let it all go. 
all that stuff in the phone, all that stuff that controls your mind, controls your life, let it go. This is renunciation. Deliberately, conscientiously, voluntarily, <laughs> voluntarily uh, relinquishing something. So we can do this. So if we develop this skill of retreat, uh, we've stepped away from the world, stepped into a spiritual space, and now we're uh, dropping our phone on the floor and enjoying the benefits that come, up, that come from that. The habit pattern of the mind, though, is really strong and you may suffer a little bit. I've seen, I've seen some stuff going down <laughs> and I've seen some tantrums also and I've seen people really suffering um, from an anxiety. So if you're one of those people who suffers from anxiety, then um, I would encourage you to, if you need to keep your phone near you, but don't turn it on, that's the way to go. So that you know that you've got it, so you don't have that separation anxiety. So be kind to yourself, okay? Um, you may laugh, but it's a thing. So I want you to understand that when it comes to renunciation, it's not this like horrible, forceful, cruel, malevolent idea that Buddhism is trying to foist upon you. It's something that you take on yourself, that something that you're willing to do because you can see some benefits in it. You can see that there's a, a reason for it. And the reason for the benefits is seeing the drawbacks. So all the stuff that we carry around with us in our life, this is a burden to us. This is something that is heavy and that we uh, only really notice when we put that burden down. So the stuff that we carry around is uh, material goods, we carry around uh, emotional baggage, we carry around stress, expectations, we carry around desire for things, desire for material objects. And uh, you can imagine sometimes um, a, a person kind of carrying around everything as, as an image, which is very, very true, very striking. I hear people say all the time, I'm so overwhelmed. I've got so much stuff. I'm so busy. I have so many things to do. And I'm like, just put them down. Relieve yourself of these things. But it's the attachment to these things that creates the suffering. So one of my favorite new gurus is Marie Kondo. And I, I did a talk uh, a few weeks ago on how to con Mari your mind. And it's actually a very um, beautiful technique that she teaches. Is everyone here familiar with? I'm just assuming. No? Wow. I live like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and I managed to hear about Mari Kondo. So she is a Japanese um, clutter expert. So she goes into people's lives. She goes into their homes. And these people have too much stuff in their life and they're suffering. They can't move. It's a source of um, aggravation in their partnerships and family life. And so she teaches them how to relieve themselves of their material possessions. And she goes through this system where she gets people to pile everything into the middle of the room so that you can see just how much stuff you have, which is a pretty good technique actually, because you're kind of like, ugh. <laughs> And you might feel slightly sick, but uh, when you see these people and they're kind of like, oh, I've got so much stuff and I don't even use it. Why? You know, this is why she does this. She forces you to look at it. And then when you look at it, you can't escape it. So this, this is a quite a good technique. And then what she says is go through it one by one. And if it sparks joy, you keep it. And if it doesn't spark joy, then you thank it which is beautiful, yeah? It's beautiful. You thank it because this thing that you're about to get rid of, you're not just throwing it away. This was once something useful to you. This was once something that had some sort of purpose, 
some sort of meaning. And so you thank it and you, you let it go. So this is actually a pretty good strategy. If you've seen Marie Kondo, then you can use this in your own life. You can use this in your own home. You can use this in the home of your mind to get rid of stuff that is no longer serving a use. And so this is what I mean by unburdening yourself. Not only are you creating space for things to flow differently, for things to move, uh, for new things to come in, you're letting go of something that is heavy and a source of suffering. So there's a wonderful story um, about a monk called Ajahn Li Damodaro, and he was leading a retreat in Thailand. So he uh, met people at the train station. They were traveling by train to the retreat destination. And all these people rocked up with suitcases full of stuff. And he's like, what are you doing? What do you, what do you even need that stuff for? And so he said, right, we're walking. And so he made these people carry their suitcases and walk. And so as they're walking along, people start to stop and open up the case and kind of throw out a few things here and there and, and they keep going and people are like, oh, and they take more things out. And eventually, of course, they had lightened themselves enough that he said, okay, now we can catch the train. So there's something important actually in um, letting stuff go. It's a skill to develop. And it's, it's not just physical things, although that is important. Even, I don't know how much I didn't come and look at, I didn't spy on you as you came today, but I have done this in previous retreats that I've taught, where people are coming for the weekend with two suitcases. And I'm like, what is in there? What could you possibly need? What is it that you fear? We bring this stuff just in case. Just in case what? You know, you've got everything that you need here. You're so well supported. And yet we, we fear something. We can't let things go. And so the, the opposite of, of the, that kind of approach to uh, travel with, you know, so many things is what the, the sangha, the monks and nuns are supposed to do. So when I came along to this retreat from Sydney, I just brought my bag and my bowl, my robes. This is my one outfit. I'm not trying to say I'm so much better than you. I've got so little clutter. <laughs> what I'm saying is it's possible. <laughs> and that's important for us to know. Because if someone is, as the Sangha is, a model of contentment, of restraint, of renunciation, then it's an inspiration for us. So we can look at that and kind of say, ah, maybe all of that stuff that I thought that I needed, maybe I don't. Maybe all of those things that I do to get money, to pay for things I think I need, maybe I don't. Maybe there's other pleasures out there. And when you start to think in this way, you start to see the scale of the problem that we face, especially when it comes to the things that we carry around. So this is uh, an image that I really like because it's a good metaphor for the way we kind of can't see the answer, the solution to our suffering. which is because we're looking in the wrong place. We think that the more we have, the more money we have, the more cars, the more the latest mobile phone, the best furniture, the best clothes, we think that this will make us happy. We believe it. We've been conditioned by society to believe it. You know, the more you consume, the happier you'll be, right? And then you kind of confuse, like I keep on doing this and yet the things that I want, you know, the things I get, 
they don't satisfy me. It changes. I become bored with those things. So the kind of um, the kind of approach that renunciation takes is that by voluntarily doing with little, by being content, by being restrained, you're actually developing a strength. Uh, you're looking in a different direction. We can't we can't get happiness by chasing sources that are inherently not causes for happiness. If the things that we chase are changeable, if they don't last, if they are inherently um, going to disappoint us, then they're not a source of happiness. They're not going to make us happy. But we keep on chasing it. Even sometimes in spirituality, we do this kind of spiritual materialism thing where we think, oh, I'm just going to do that course and then I'll be cured. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to listen to that guru and then I'll know the answer to everything. I'm just going to go to this talk. I'm just going to read this book, this other self-help book. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then I'll be happy. We keep on looking for this future source of happiness, even in our spiritual life. And this means that we never find contentment. We never find peace. So that's what we're looking for. But we're looking in the wrong direction. We know somehow when we go shopping, after a bad day at work, we know that we're just looking to relieve a little bit of our suffering. We know when we go and we open the fridge and we look in and we stare, we know that we're just trying to plug a little bit of our suffering with a little bit of happiness. You know when you listen to uh, a sad song when you're sad, that you're, you're hoping that that sad song will even just give you a little relief from the sadness in your heart. You, you hope that when you distract yourself with an entire season of Game of Thrones, that you are going to be happy afterwards because you've done it. But these things, sorry to tell you, are not causes for happiness. They're not sources of true happiness. We know this because they're impermanent and they change. So if, if things are really truly causes for happiness, then they are lasting. They don't become impermanent and they don't change. They're sustainable. So the Buddha is a wonderful um, creator of images, of similes. And I, I, I'm a visual learner, I'm a visual thinker, so I really enjoy um, the power of the, the images that he uses. So when he talked about sensual pleasures, he would often give some very visceral, very beautiful and very meaningful, potent imagery. And there's a particular sutta that I love, and it's called the Patalia Sutta. And in this sutta, he gives some examples of our desire for sensual pleasures. So when I say sensual pleasures, of course, um, I'm talking about things that we enjoy all the time. That it could be anything. And for different people, they're different things. So for you, like the kind of pleasures that delight your mind are not necessarily going to be the things that other people are thinking of at this moment. But you know them, yeah? You'll know them. If, you, if I say to you the things that you're into, the things that you're uh, invested in, addicted to, can't stop, uh, the things that occupy your thoughts when you meditate. These are the things that we're talking about here, the things that obsess our mind, the things that we're always going out towards. And so when the Buddha talked about um, sensual pleasures, he said it's like a dog who's been given a bone, a bone that is well scraped clean of meat, a bone that's just got a little bit of blood on it. And so here you see this dog chewing this bone, and the Buddha asked, what do you think? If this dog eating this well-scraped bone, will he ever assuage his hunger? Will he ever fill his belly? No. He'll just get the taste. Just a little bit of a taste. But he'll never truly be satisfied. This is not a nourishment. It's a bone. There's no meat on that bone. The dog is not going to be able to fill itself up. 
it's just going to taste it and want more. This is a pretty good image for sensual pleasures, yeah? So think about mm, maybe a more current, maybe like a digital form of image. Think of maybe something like scrolling down your newsfeed, this insatiable, never-ending scroll on and on, never satisfied, never knowing when to stop. Just maybe this next scroll will be the thing that makes me happy. Maybe that one. No, okay. Maybe this one. This is the one. Or maybe that next season. That will make me content. So you can see actually how the mind of craving, the mind of tending towards these kinds of um, sensual pleasures is insatiable. We're never satisfied. We always want more. So that's the first image that the Buddha uses to talk about sensual pleasures in the Patalya Sutta. The second is uh, an image of some birds fighting over a scrap of meat. And so this is a wonderful image and it reminds me, I've seen on the television, pictures of your um, Black Monday, is it Black Friday? Black Friday sales. <laughs> so these birds fighting over this scrap of meat, these shoppers fighting each other <laughs> for, um, I don't know, a, t a tank top or whatever. <laughs> so whatever it is, you see that this uh, sensual pleasures are actually a competitive thing that we have to compete with other people for our sensual pleasures. And that's kind of an interesting thought. When you think about it, it's kind of like scarcity value. Like we actually can only consume what is available. So the things that we might want to enjoy, like uh, a sunny day, going to the beach or um, a particular restaurant or what else, concert tickets. If everyone else is interested in that thing too, then we are going to have to compete with them. So there's only limited resources, only limited pleasures, and we have to compete. So this is something that um, you might not think of as a problem, but actually this is what causes most of the suffering in the world because we are constantly competing at a local level, at a global level also for access to resources and products and things like that. So this is a big problem. Uh, another image the Buddha uses is the image of a glowing pit of embers. And he says, imagine if someone was to take a man or a woman and a person and take them close to this fiery ember, coal burning pit. Would they struggle? Yes. Why would they struggle? Because they want to get away from that. So we want to get away from suffering. We go towards sensual pleasures. We're always struggling. We're always agitated. We're always hoping to get something. It's a lot of movement in our mind. Another image he uses is the image of a dream. This is something um, we've experienced probably. We've had dreams of the way the world could be, the way our life could be. We've woken up from a pleasant dream only to be disappointed by reality. We've seen someone on Tinder or on Grindr with a good filter only to meet them in real life and to be disappointed. We've I've read something about like really bad purchases from like, um, eBay and things like that where people they showed the, the things that they'd purchased and were disappointed in. So there's this person who had bought this beautiful rug, what they thought was a beautiful rug, and they were a little bit disappointed because it ended up being this big. <laughs> 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 they thought they were getting a bargain, yeah? And so we get disappointed by these things, the hype, the excitement. You know, that, uh, that piece of pizza, that first bite, oh, it's going to be so good. And maybe it is. And then the second bite, it's a little less good. So these things change. They disappoint. And so they can't be relied upon. Suffering. 
the last image the Buddha uses is, is kind of a bit wacky actually. So it's the image of uh, a tree and there's this person that comes along and they want the fruit. They want the fruit from the tree. And so they, they climb the tree and they get in the tree and they start eating the fruit. And then they kind of get so content and full of sugar that they kind of become relaxed and maybe fall asleep. But then someone else comes along and they can't climb trees, but they still want fruit. And so they get an ax and they chop down the tree. And the Buddha says, what do you think? Is that person up the tree in danger? Yes, they are in danger. And you think, where are you going with this Buddha? <laughs> But I think what the, the moral of this story is it's kind of like the corner office. So you finally get the corner office and then some young thing comes along who's fresher, better, cheaper and your success, the fruits that you've gotten in your life can very easily be taken away from you. So this is why they're, they're not constant. Another image from the same sutta is the idea of borrowed goods that someone who has access to friends uh, takes their possessions and treats them as if they were their own they walk around town wearing these fancy necklaces maybe in a lovely chariot looking cool and people think oh that person's got so much stuff but they're all borrowed and then when the people see them whose possessions they belong to they're like give them back and so this is another thing that, that happens. We can't actually keep these things. We are constantly in debt. We, um, we, we, we've got credit card debt. We think we own things. And even all that stuff that we've got, eventually we will have to part with. We can't own it forever. We're going to have to die. All the stuff that you have does not belong to you. You'll have to give it back. Someone will take it away from you eventually, especially uh, when you're dead. <laughs> so, why do you hold so tightly to these things? Is this really the kind of mind you want to have at the end of your life? Oh no, what about my Pokemon collection? <laughs> what is the kind of mind you want to have at the end? Letting go. Renunciation. But anyway, so that's the, that's the, that's the spiritual path. It's a spiritual path because it's not the path that we kind of learn in, in consumeristic, materialistic, capitalistic society. It's a difficult path. Sometimes it's difficult to hear these things. You might think that you're going on a spiritual journey and it's going to be easy. It's complicated. Being a person is hard. The whole point of um, coming to a place like this, being with other like-minded people, is to make that journey, journey easier. Is to make that journey uh, a journey where you have some certainty, some confidence. So the good thing about being here with Buddhist Insights is that you are part of a spiritual community. It doesn't matter how you identify, if you think of yourself as a Buddhist, if you think of yourself as a spiritual person, if you think of yourself as a, a person who doesn't think of themselves as a person, if you, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter. You're here with good people. Good people are going to inspire you. They're going to bring out the best qualities that are inside yourself. And so we rely upon each other to, to be good people, to be good humans. And there's a beautiful concept in Buddhism called Kalyana Mitta. Have you ever heard this term before? It means admirable friendship, good friendship, spiritual friendship. And I offer that to you here today. Please consider me as a spiritual friend, and I mean it. Please. Uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, concerns, please talk to me. Please talk to Venerable Vimala, who is my spiritual friend. Please, um, please 
Think of us as friends. Let us help each other. This is a very important concept. The most bestest friend that I have is the Buddha. He is an inspiration to me because he taught such profound wisdom. And he taught a path. And he showed that path to other people they were able to practice too. And the Buddha said that this is the whole, this, this act of spiritual friendship is the whole of the spiritual path. It's because of spiritual friendship that people can develop. It's because of spiritual friendship they hear about higher truths. It's because of spiritual development that they can develop right view, an understanding of the way things really are in the world. And it's because of spiritual friendship that we can come out of our suffering and have peace and happiness in our lives. So it's a very, very profound thing that you have uh, done today by coming here to be around spiritual people, like-minded people. And although we're not going to be talking to each other, although we're not going to be uh, having interactions for the next few days, on Sunday I've scheduled some um, spontaneous <laughs> social interactions. <laughs> so, so you can have a connection. We're going to have some chai, we're going to chill out, and we're going to chat with each other. And that gives you an opportunity in the near future to get to know some of the interesting people who have come on this retreat. And so uh, I, I give you that as a kind of like thing to look forward to. Um, and so that means you don't have to talk to each other and interact in the next few days because you know you're going to be doing it later. Yeah? And also, you'll get many benefits from that. So spiritual friendship is something that appears in, in the suttas. And uh, there's a, 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 a sutta that I want to talk about um, which has to do with the topic I've already started discussing, which is renunciation and sensual pleasures. Because renunciation opposes sensual pleasures. And it's a difficult thing to believe. Here I am sitting at the front of the room saying, sensual pleasures are bad. Renunciation is good. And people don't always believe that kind of talk. I mean, why would you? You're like, look, I know where I can get good pizza. Uh, I, I know where I can get this or that. That makes me happy. Not having those things does not make me happy. Probably... Venerable Kalika, you don't know what you're talking about. And there was people like this also in the Buddha's time, who hearing a teaching would have doubts, they'd have suspicions, they'd have some complaints and criticisms. And so the Buddha gave a beautiful simile uh, about this. And he said, there's two friends. They're walking through the jungle and they come to a mountain. And one friend says, uh, you wait here, I'm gonna go up the mountain. And uh, I don't know how they do how, how this happened in the Buddha's time. They didn't have mobile phones, but magically, the person at the top was able to shout down <laughs> to the person below. And so the person below is like, "What can you see up there?" And the person at the top says, oh, "I, you would not believe it. You would not believe what I can see. I can see uh, palaces, pleasure gardens." lakes, swimming pools, I can see beautiful buildings, so many things from up here. And the person down, who just can see some trunks of trees, and this big blob of a mountain is like, I don't believe you. No, surely not. And the person at the top says, okay. And so they go all the way down, and they grab the person by the hand, and they take them all the way up that hill. And then they show them, this is what you can see when you have some perspective. This is what you can see from uh, a point of view that is out of your usual range of experience. So the Buddha and many other spiritual people tell us, this is going to be hard to believe, that there are other forms of happiness not material. There's other forms of happiness that we can experience that are not material, not sensory, not related to the body, 
not related to shopping, to senses. It's a spiritual happiness, a happiness of the mind. And this is the kind of happiness that makes people like me and Venerable Vimala abandon the usual way of life, full of sensual pleasures, and, and go instead to live in a monastery in the middle of nowhere, to have no possessions, to have an opportunity away from all of those things, to develop the happiness that comes from within. And this is a kind of happiness that isn't dependent on any of those things that are changeable, that are impermanent. This is a kind of happiness that you can develop within yourself. The more you develop it, the more it grows. The more it grows, the more you develop it, the bigger it gets. The more bliss, the more joy, the more pleasure you'll have in your life. So trust me, there is a spiritual happiness. And you, by developing the skill of renunciation, can start to experience it on this retreat and in your life. Truly. So you've all heard the unfortunate news that Grumpy the Cat is no longer with us, just leaving a seemingly endless array of means for us to remember her by. Have any of you experienced some bliss in your meditation before? Yeah? A little bit? A lot? Enough? Sometimes when we talk about meditation and bliss, people start to crave it a lot. They start to think, I want the bliss. Bring on the bliss. All I have is the suffering. All I have is the aching body. So the bliss isn't something that you can get by wanting. This is something that comes from letting go from relinquishing, from a practice of renunciation. It's all that wanting that distracts our mind from becoming settled, from becoming peaceful. So all of those sensory pleasures are what take us away from being present. In the, in the session that's coming up tomorrow called Retrain, we're going to look at how to train our monkey mind out of these patterns of thinking that destroy our peace. So that's something to look forward to. Um, we're almost finished this session, so just hang in here. I know it's getting late, but for me in Sydney, it's just time to wake up. So. <laughs> and I want to tell another story that gives us confidence that there is this, um, this idea of uh, spiritual bliss, a spiritual happiness that is attainable in this lifetime. <laughs> So it's a story of a king called um, Bhadya Kaligoda Putta. So he was a king and he decided to give up being a king and become a monk. And he left his palace, left his uh, harem, left all of his treasures, left everything behind and went and lived in a forest away from the world. And he was developing his meditation practice. And he was getting pretty good at it. And he started to experience some bliss. And so, so much bliss, he couldn't control himself. He started saying, Aho sukam, aho sukam, which I'm sure all you Pali language experts know, means, oh, the bliss, <laughs> the bliss. You know, he's basically saying, ah, oh, yeah, pleasure, you know. And unfortunately, some monks were walking past and they heard him saying, oh, the bliss, the bliss. And they were a little bit suspicious <laughs> that maybe he was doing something unmonk like <laughs> And so they went and reported him. How mean. They dobbed him into the Buddha and the Buddha summoned him. And so the Buddha comes, uh, sorry, Kali, Venerable Kaligoda Buddha comes and says, uh, Buddha says to him, is it true that you were in the forest saying, Aho Sukam, Aho Sukam? And he's like, yes, yes it was. And he's like, why? Why were you saying this? And the Venerable says, before, when I was a king, I had everything. I had treasure, palace, a harem, and yet I didn't enjoy a single moment's peace. I was so worried. I had guards 
posted outside my bedroom. I was so worried about losing my treasure, about losing my life. But now in the forest, I have nothing and he couldn't be happier. And so this is the, the, the kind of pathway that the Buddha pointed to over and over and over again, that we can gain some freedom from the suffering of sensory pleasures and gain some happiness through our meditation. And so this is an image um, that I'll leave you with tonight. It's kind of like a mascot for us. And it's the story of a turtle, a tortoise, a turtle tortoise, who, seeing a jackal coming to eat it, just very cleverly pulled its arms and legs in and pulled its head in. And then the jackal couldn't get the tortoise and so went away. So the jackal is, of course, this sensory pleasure coming to grab us and tucking in a shell like that is a, a metaphor, a symbol for renunciation, for meditation. So this is something that we're going to do this weekend. We're going to tuck our heads into our shell. We're going to pull in our legs and arms. We're just going to bunker down away from all the things that we usually uh, entertain ourselves with in life. And we're going to do some non-sensory pleasure stuff. We're going to do some mental pleasure, some mental happiness. And so, this is what we're doing next for a very short time, because it's getting late. So we're going to do um, some power meditation, for like maybe 10, 15 minutes of power meditation, and then we're going to go to bed. Does that sound okay? Does anyone have any questions?